We're going to talk about um, not forgetting. We're going to talk about why it's important for us not to forget what God has done for us, where he's brought us from, and how we can so easily, you know, get caught up in complaining, murmuring and complaining. And you don't realize it because it come on you kind of subtle because you think you're just chatting it up with your homegirl or your homeboy. But at the same time, God is hearing these things that we're saying. And he's sitting there like, it's like, this is the best example I can give you. And um, no shade gets my daughter. I'm just giving y'all an example. I'm mom, that's dad. And we do a lot for the chick, right? So sometimes when she get mad because things are not quite going the way that she wants them to go, she'll get on the phone with her homies or go on Facebook and start blasting us. You know what I'm saying? And all I can say is, well, dang, you done forgot, boo. Like, you, 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 you really, you done forgot. And she'll come back around and she'll be like, mom was just venting. But even in those moments of venting, you're complaining. You're complaining about something that was provided for you. You're not even taking into consideration sacrifices that was made to provide that for you because you can just get real accustomed of getting things. And Kayla spoiled. It just is what it is. I did it. You know, um, I would give her the world if I could. That's my child. And I believe God feels the same way about us. He, wanted, he don't want to hold nothing back from us at all. So it's like she asked me for anything. I want to give it to her. But at the time that she asking me for it, sometimes it may not be in my means to do it. I may have to release my faith for it. I may have to say, I don't say no necessarily, but I may be like, you know, give me a minute. It's going to take some time. And then you also realize in that that you have to see where they are mature-wise. Mature you know, they might be asking for something that because their friends and stuff got it or other people are doing it, but they're not quite ready to handle the responsibility that comes along with it. So sometimes, you know, people be like, you know, well, I prayed and I, I asked God for such and such and he didn't give it to me. That's so not true. God is a father. If we really, really embrace that, that he's our father and not just God like floating around, that he's a good, good father and he knows us better than we know ourselves. And while we can be asking for stuff, a lot of times we ask for things because we see somebody else have it. We like how it looks that they have it or that they're driving it or they're living in it and we want it. But he's saying, you're not quite ready for the responsibility that comes along with that. You want a Mercedes Benz, but do you understand that the how much the tires cost? Yes, I'm a good father. I'm going to make sure that you're straight. But there's some understanding that you need to have about the, what I'm giving you. Because if you don't respect what I'm giving you, you're not going to take care of it. And you're going to just be here like, well, dad, you know what I'm saying? My car broke down, give me another one. And that's just not the way it's supposed to be. We are supposed to be a good stewards over whatever it is that we have. So, you know, we might not start out in the Mercedes. So if we do, we might start out in a smaller class of the Mercedes. And that might not be what our dream goal is, but when you get the Mercedes, you still got to wash it, you know? You still got to vacuum it. You still got to keep it. You still got to take care of it. You can't have the mindset that, oh, well, if you tear it up, you're going to just get another one. So God is, he's a father in, in that regard. And so um, why did we start talking about Michaela? <laughs> Forgetting. Forgetting. Thank you. Forgetting, you know, what has been provided for you. And it's so easy to do it. And then when you get into the complaining, it turns in, it, it will stifle your growth in so many different ways. And while it's important for us, again, you know, we can have our friends, we can have our husband, I'll go to Andrew, I'll talk to him, or I'll talk to my peers, or whatever, but I still, he still challenges me to be mindful of what I'm saying. He'll say to me quickly, to me, should don't dig up your seed. You know what I mean? So he puts me in remembrance. So it's important to have people in your life that will help you remember, right? So, with all that being said, I was um, studying out some stuff for myself, and um, I was in, I started, I said, you know, on this new journey that, um, that we're on and learning who God is, I was like, I was, my question that I had was, God, so what's the whole 
relationship with the Jews? Like, what's all this about? Like, you know, we're reading about it over here in the Old Covenant, and we're reading how, you know, the people then, they had they, 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 the, the Jews persecuted, you know, Jesus and so forth. And I'm like, but I thought the Jews was God's chosen people. So it's like I was hearing the word all these years, but it's now I'm really beginning to put all these different pieces together. So I said, with the understanding that I'm getting, with the leading of Holy Spirit and the way that Holy Spirit is giving me understanding and things, I said, let me just go back to the beginning. I've read the Bible before. I said, but let me just go back to the beginning because I believe that this time around, I'll have fresh ear and I have fresh eyes to hear some things and see some things that I didn't see before. So boy, have I. And, um, and so I understand, and I'm still, I'm still growing. I'm just only in, uh, what, do the mind of me now? Yeah, numbers, Deuteronomy, one of them. And, um, but when I was listening to, and I was listening to it, I was listening to the Bible experience. Y'all should get that, by the way. It's totally awesome. The Bible experience is a bunch of actors and um, musicians and stuff, and they really, really, they, they read the Bible to you, but it just brought the life. You hear the cows and the goats in the background, and eh, and you hear the people fighting and screaming in the neighborhood, and it just brings it to life. It's like a real theatrical presentation. So, like when you're listening to it, you're just like, ooh. And so that's what's been happening to me. So I'm listening to it, and over and over and over again, I kept hearing them complaining. I was like, now you know I've read that before, but it was so loud in my ears, and all I could think about. Y'all, y'all just keep forgetting what God, y'all just, he just, did you, did he not just, and I'm in the bathroom listening to it, I'm like, wait, let me stop, and did go back, because I was like, and then I'll look back and be like, and then I know he did that, and then now y'all gonna come over here because things have gotten a little tight, and now you upset, and it happens to all of us like that, we, and, and the funny thing is, is that when we go back to that place, when we'll go back, we will forget because we don't remember, if that makes sense. We don't remember, we don't keep ourselves from remembrance. And for whatever reason, I don't know what it is about the past, but the past got a way of calling you when things get a little uncomfortable and tight. And I was talking to Michaela the other day and she was saying, Mom, she she said she said she feel like one of the reasons why people go back is because they already know what the outcome that's gonna be. Why they go back to abusive relationships because they know what to expect and it ain't gonna be no surprises. He gonna kick my tail. I can I I, I know that, but my bills will be paid. I can I can have my car back. I can live in my house again. I'm gonna just have to put up with a little, you know. You understand what I'm saying? Why do people go back to, you know, relationships? And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a physically abusive one. It could be an emotionally abusive one. Why do people go back? Because at least if I go back, you know, I know what it's going to be. I'll have a, I don't have to start over. And she was just saying how comfortable it can be how relationships um, or uh, a job and you know that you have greater qualifications to go to go further, but you will keep going back. You know, if things don't go all right in one way, you know, you get a little little annoyed, a little ticked off, things get a little off, you will go back to what's comfortable. And it makes no sense when we think about it and we like think it through. It's just like that's so unhealthy. But that's what the people, that's what the Israelites was like. Why you take us out of Egypt? Okay, so let's back up a little bit. So Joseph, okay, Joseph was, um, you know, Joseph had gotten sold off by his brothers and everything because they was jealous of him because Joseph was telling them stuff. He was telling them, you know, look, y'all going to be bowing down to me or whatever, whatever. And it was like, you know, we tired of you. So they decided to get rid of him. And in doing so, Joseph went in and out of slavery. Y'all know that story. Anyway, he found favor with Pharaoh, such favor with Pharaoh, he became the second in command, okay? So in the process of him becoming a second in, in command, the, the, the genius that God gave him was because he knew a famine was coming was to make preparation, right? So he did that. He got his, he got his family back. 
So, um, you know, the brothers came. Y'all know the story, how his brothers came, and then they ended up getting Jacob. And anyway, they ended up getting the whole family back. Pharaoh approved it. They got a spot. Joseph was like, okay. And the Israelite people were treated extremely well. They were growing in numbers. They had the money. They had the cows. They had the cattle. They had the land. They had everything. They was living good, right? They were living actually great. Time goes on, Joseph goes off the scene, a new pharaoh comes on the scene, and this pharaoh, which I don't understand how this pharaoh didn't know about Joseph, because just like we know about other presidents, he had to know about Joseph, he had to know about what was established, but he didn't take into consideration what the other pharaoh had done and just kind of come in. He's like, he want to come in and do things different. He got mad because he saw how great the Israelites were, and he was like, yo, go get them. They're going to come work for us. And he enslaved them, just like that. And they became his property. And when they became his property, their housing changed. Everything that they had changed. The way that they knew life, it changed because a new pharaoh was in town. And so as a result of this, the people are crying out and Moses, y'all know the story about how Moses came to be and all this and all that and everything. And Moses has an encounter with the Lord through the burning bush and so forth. And they get to having a conversation and God tells them, listen, I've been hearing the cries of my people and I'm choosing you <laughs> to bring them out. Moses is like, hold up. Who am I? What you mean? Like, that's a, that's a big task. Like, you want me to go up against Pharaoh? Like, but that was his encounter with God, the great I am, okay? He was like, I can't talk real good. He was so God, he was like, you know, gave him Aaron, his brother Aaron. So Aaron helped him out. So fast forward. So the people are in bondage. They, we, they, um, God gives instructions, and fa I'm fast forwarding, but one of the instructions were that they were going to have a time of Passover, Okay, that they would have to sacrifice a goat or a lamb, and they would have to, he gave them instructions on how to cook it, how to prepare it, how to eat it, unleavened bread, all that kind of stuff. He said, take the blood, put it over the doorpost. The blood that's over the doorpost, the deaf angel, the destroyer will pass by. Won't bother y'all. Y'all good. But he told them, he was like, you know, um, you got to follow these instructions. He also gave them the instructions to take the, um, all the, the wealth, if you will, from Egypt, the, 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 the jewelry and all this kind of stuff. He told them to take, take it all. So they followed the instructions, and they're gone. And now don't keep in mind, it was a whole bunch of stuff that went on. You have to read it for yourself, but a whole bunch of stuff that went on to get them to this point. So we fast forward to now, there all the people are exiting out of Egypt, okay? So mind you, here's Moses, it's how I envision it, okay? So it's Moses, he got the people, and he was like, all right, y'all come follow me because God has promised us, blah, 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 and I'm like, and they're like, all right, bet. So they're going, going, going. Now mind you, they done seen all kind of miracles, frogs and pestilence and all this kind of stuff. Now the Israelite people did not get hurt by any of this stuff. All the hurt, harm, and danger fell on the Egyptian people. The Israelite people were spared the entire time. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. They were protected the entire time. Yeah. So here they go. They going out. They're like, all right. And they got all their stuff. Because they, 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 you know, they got all the, the wealth and stuff from each. They got all their stuff. So they, you know, they good. They don't really know what they're going. But they following Moses. So then they get to the point. They get to, I imagine that it was a heel. Yeah, I don't know why it's a heel, but I imagine it is a heel. So they're coming and they're coming down the hill. They get to the bottom. There's nowhere to go to the left. I mean, that's the right. There's nowhere to go to the right. There's nowhere to go to the left. If they go back, they got to go back to Egypt. They're going to go back to bondage. They're in their mind. They're going to a place of freedom. Okay? So they're stuck because now they're coming up against the Red Sea. And they're like, um, ain't no boats out here. Like, what are we going to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, exactly where do we go from here? So let's pick it up right there. Let's look at Exodus 14. Let me know when you reach. There, for the most part. 
Verse 1, then the Lord says to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Phi, um, whatever, between Midgal, Midgal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephron. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh, and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am God, well, I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go. Like they came to themselves like, wait a minute, the folk that was serving us, okay, they was cooking our food and building our buildings and everything. They're no longer here. So who's going to take care of us? So it says, um, so what have we done? So we've let the Israelites go and have lost, we, have, we have lost our services. So we, so, so we had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of his best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all, uh, over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that they pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they came by the sea at the bottom of the hill, in my opinion. Number 10. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, what it, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to this desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They really thought that. Like, fear had them at a place. Now, can you imagine what I was saying earlier? So you go back to a bad relationship out of fear. He beating your butt. But you go back because it's better to go back because at least now you don't have to figure out how you're going to eat, where your clothes going to come from, what you're going to drive, where you're going to live. Fear. Fear. What have you go back to places that are not healthy for you? In your mind, emotional relationships, all kind of stuff. I'm kind of stuck on relationships because I got stuck there for a season. I know what that I know what that felt like. Fear will have you doing some really interesting things. It will have you settling for what's not God's best at all. It will have you not being in a posture where you can hear from God at all. Because you're captivated with fear. He said, the Lord he said, um, so um where were we? So what da, 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 Egyptians no, 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 where was I? I'm sorry, something? Moses answered the people. And this right here, so we've been singing that song, God is fighting for us. You know me, I need scripture on songs. So um, several months ago when I first heard the song, I was like, I didn't want to even give you all the song until I had scripture on it. So initially, I saw this and I was fine. But then as I was doing this study for this, it came back up again. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. First of all, you got to get out of fear. You got to get out of fear because fear will paralyze you. It will. Faith will motivate you. It will move you. It will give you expectations. It will, it will develop hope. It will do so many things in you that fear won't do. Fear will keep you right here. Faith will have you on the, on the edge of the limb, but at least you're moving. At least you're moving. He says, um, do not be afraid. He says, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you, bring you today. Now that right there, when I read that, made me think about how we're not supposed to be concerned about tomorrow. That we are supposed to give God praise, give God thanks, thanksgiving. Every day that we have, every opportunity that we have is to celebrate who God is and what he's done. God give us, a, each day that God gives us is another opportunity to remember. It's another opportunity to come out of bad situations. It's another opportunity to stand in your healing. It's another opportunity to stand in your relationship. It's another opportunity. But even in those opportunities, you got to remember where you came from. That, you know what, I didn't have to wake up this morning, but I did. So thank you, Lord. 
What is it that you would have for me to do today? Not tomorrow. See, and we're conditioned to be looking. And it's just out of, we talked about that months ago. We're conditioned to think down the line. And that's fine. But you can get so caught up with thinking about the future that you miss out on today and all that today has to offer. People can get so caught up in building their businesses that they miss out on their immediate relationships. Andrew and I were talking on the way here about there is such a huge sacrifice that comes to married couples that not many take into consideration. I didn't. I didn't marry. I didn't realize who I was marrying. I did not realize the greatness that was on the inside of him. I did not realize that he was called to people, to serve people. I didn't. I just figured I'm marrying him. That's my husband. But when you marry somebody with vision and purpose, as women, oh my gosh, the things that we take on, the, the fact that we have to position ourselves to share them with the society, to whatever they've been called to. Because I was um, telling him about a show that I was watching, and the man was a, a cop, and he was a good cop. He even turned detective, he was really good at what he did. He wanted a wife, he wanted a family, he had a wife and he had a family, but he had no time for him. He had no time for him because he was so busy, because his call to serve the, the city that they lived in was so great until as much as he loved his wife and as much as he loved his children, he just did not, it was always, it was you know, birthday parties, phone, babe, I gotta go, gotta go work on this case. And if she did not understand that or respect that, their marriage could have completely fallen apart. But she had to understand some things. That when I marry you, I'm marrying what you've been called to. And that means that there's going to be some sacrifices that I'm going to have to make. And it's not going to always be comfortable. See, we women, I don't know if we realize how awesome we are. We some bad creatures. Oh, my gosh. Nobody... Nobody can do the job the way that we do our job. Because we will, we will rock with some dudes that don't mean us no good. How much more we could rock with somebody that, was, that is treating us right? Because we'll stand behind, we will, honey, we will listen to his lies. We will listen to his apologies, his I'm sorry. Because we see, we see potential. We'll just hang on in there because we believe the best. But let a woman mess up. Dude out the door. They, 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 don't know, they don't have what we have. They don't have it. And it's okay. It's not to put you down, but it's also to understand our strengths. So when we understand our strengths as women, we won't get so frustrated because we understand we anointed to do this. But we allow the system to frustrate us because then we'll go sit and have a glass of wine with our girlfriend and she'll tell us how perfect her relationship is and you like this knucklehead. Like I'm not understanding why he not doing ba 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 ba. But you don't understand the, the grace that you have to stand in your office, I don't have that. Let me get back focused. Let me just get back focused. Let me just get back focused. But there is a sacrifice that comes along with relationships. Marrying into someone who has vision. Marrying into being a part of a place that has vision. There's sacrifice. There's some things that you're not going to understand all the time. You know, but you got to be willing to stand. You got to be willing to know and put yourself in remembrance. What did God say to you? And see, that's the part that we miss because we're so thirsty. Andrew, the first man that ever um, um, proposed to me, and I accepted. No shade. I didn't get no proposals. I had other relationships, but nobody else proposed to me but him. It wasn't because I was thirsty, but it was because of where I was in my life. I've always wanted to be married. I'm just that chick. I just didn't want to be having no whole bunch of boyfriends and whole bunch of relationships and all this kind of stuff. So really, it's, I guess the reason why nobody else asked me, because I probably would have said yes, not even counting up the cost. 
But now when you have a relationship with God, it's a game changer for you. And see, that's why sometimes, you know, when we sit up here and we try to share with you our testimonies and we try to give you all advice, it's to prepare you. It's not to scare you off from being married, but it's to prepare you for what marriage really does consist of. And it's not just waking up. It's not just getting, you know what I'm saying? It's not just doing that. It's a whole lot more that comes. It's a whole live office that you stand in as a wife. Y'all know, and I'm going to um, get back to my story, but y'all know over in, what was it, um, the Proverbs 31 woman. When she was out in the village, she was fly. Like, you know, she got up, she handled her business at the house, she went out in the market, she coming through, people's like, yo, her husband taking good care of her. Meanwhile, she the one doing most of the work, but he gets the credit for it. Do you understand? Ladies, when you have people at your house, it ain't your husband that done the cleaning. But he gets the accolades, oh my gosh, you know, you have such a beautiful home. Hello? So I was the one that was on my floor cleaning it, okay? Like, I don't get a shout out. But it's okay. But I'm just saying, but when we recognize our office, y'all, it just makes things easier. Because then you can just do this humbly. Because you know who you are. And so when we try to help young, the women and so forth get married, we're preparing you for re what really comes along with it and letting you know that you really need to develop, why you need to develop your relationship with God. Because it's a grace. Your relationship needs to be of such that you can put a demand on Holy Spirit. You can put a demand on the knowledge of God. It doesn't mean that it's not going to come with challenges. But a relationship with God Oh my gosh, when you love him and you allow the love of God to come up on you, there are things that your daddy can correct you about, tap you on the shoulder, and it will prevent you from going in the bedroom and going off on somebody or doing something reckless. But unfortunately, when we get in our emotions, we talked about anger in the Bible study. How many of y'all caught the Bible study that we did live? Ah, it was so much fun. Go back and catch the playback on Facebook. It's okay. But anger, when it gets inside of you, it can push you to do some things. And it's, 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 it's a real emotional move. It's nothing spiritual about it. You know what I mean? The Bible says be angry and sin not. But many times when we get angry, that's the first thing we go through. We, we, we go to sin. And when sin is resurrected before you, you ain't thinking about crying out to the Father for help. But when you're developing yourself in the spirit, you can be angry and not sin by saying, you know what? I'm feeling some type of way right now. I'm just going to stay over here. And you begin to pray in the spirit and you trust. Because, again, I go back to he rewards you as you diligently seek after him. You going after him. He was like, I got you, boo. Don't even worry about it. There's safety in God. Your life is really hidden in him. And you can stay, people can look at you and be like, girl, I don't even know how you did that. And it ain't even really anything you can explain. And it may sound real religious when you be like, I give all glory and honor to God. That's the real stuff. Those of you who are single and are seeking a husband. There's a lot of sacrifices that come with being. It's a lot of fun, too. But there's a lot of sacrifices that come with being married from the husband's perspective, too, because he can marry a woman that's vision driven and got goals and aspirations. And he could be the type of dude that wants to support what she's doing, which will may require her to be gone traveling on the road. My friend Shannon, she's a flight attendant, not a flight attendant, but she works in the in the, um, the airlines. And so she got privileges to fly wherever she want to go. So I don't know if Derek realized the sacrifice that he was going to be making, you know, allowing her to go work at the airlines. But I know as her friend, she stayed in the wind. <laughs> However, she's taking advantage of the benefits that she has. And they be going to, they just got back from Rome. Yes, I'm telling your business. <laughs> but he goes too, but 
there's some other things that are in her heart to do and they have to talk about it and they have to have an understanding so that he can be supportive and then she can be supportive when he has to go out of town and do things with his business. And then you have to be able to trust each other. Do you understand? So all these things have to be in place because that's when he off, you know, on conferences and that's when infidelity comes into place. But if you have a good foundation and a good relationship and a good understanding, you don't have to fall into those traps. But you need to develop that foundation from the beginning as best as you can. Ask the questions that you need to ask. I say that all the time. Ask questions. Ask questions. Amen. So where are we? Exodus. Okay. So he goes on to say, you know, the Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. And then he says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Now, what did I take away from that whole thing? A lot, as you all heard. But one of the things I took away from it the most, which pertains to this message, is that if initially they were in fear and they began to complain. They began to forget. And he was just like, you know what? Be still. He said, the Lord will fight for you. So that means in being still, I took that as also sometimes you just need to be quiet. You don't need to say everything that you think. You don't need to express every being still. You don't need to express everything that you feel in that moment. You have to be remind. You have to be mindful of the fact of what God has done for you. Go back and do a check because there has to be something that you can be thankful about and remember that what he what he's done for you. All right. Let's look at um, let's look at First Corinthians. Uh, 10. Wait, before we go to 1 Corinthians 10, let's go in, uh, let's go in Numbers, Numbers 11. Y'all getting anything this morning? Numbers 11, mm-hmm. Now the people complained about the hardships in the hearing of the Lord. When he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. Moses, as you'll see and you'll continue to see as we're reading on, Moses was an intercessor. Okay, Moses was had an opportunity, a beautiful opportunity to actually be in the presence of God in a way that a lot of the other people were not. And so he had he knew how to hear from God. He knew how to respond to God. He knew the importance of being obedient to God. But God, as Andrew and I were talking, he uses people. God uses people. God being who he is, he could have came a whole nother way with rescuing the Egypt. First of all, it didn't even have to happen, but it did, okay? So after it did, he raised up a person. Do you understand Moses' lineage, where Moses came from? Moses wasn't even supposed to be alive. Moses was supposed to be dead when the decree was to go through to kill all the male boys. But he was spared. He was set apart for purpose. Do y'all know that I believe that all of us are set apart for a purpose? If we're here, we got something we're supposed to be doing. An enemy can get you so off and get you so frustrated and you concentrating and focusing on things that ain't got nothing to do with God. It just frustrates your whole life. Then when you begin to give yourself to the Lord, you begin to see purpose. And a lot of the things that were inside of you begin to unfold. And there's a whole other creative anointing that will rest, rest on it because now you're doing it to honor God. So everything that you endeavor to do doesn't make it a bad thing, but it doesn't always mean that it's something that you're supposed to be doing that is to glorify God. So Moses, he was saved and set apart. And Moses was the mouthpiece. And when God used to break out and get upset, Moses would be like, hey, Dad. He didn't say, Dad. I'm just going to say, Dad. Come on now. You, you Calm down a little bit. Telling God to calm down, that's a big thing. But at the same time, they had a relationship. And so God still uses people to this day. When you see us and people in here praying and interceding and doing things, even as ministers, all of us, 
called by God, believers, all of us are positioned to be able to stand in the gap on the behalf of somebody else. To be a voice for people who don't know how or don't have one at the time. So Moses was standing and talking to God on the behalf of some people. So it's an awesome thing. And he, he cried out to him on several occasions. But he says, he says, when the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the place was called Tab Tabera because the fire from the Lord had burned among them. Verse 4. Um, anybody know what, you don't know what we are? I heard somebody saying something about it. So we're in Numbers 11, verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. All the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. So again, can you imagine giving your very best to your child and then you got to hear them talking junk about you? Love you, Matt. But it's hard because it makes you start questioning yourself. It start making you ask stuff like, am I not enough? Like, what more can I be doing? Like, oh my gosh. Oh, she's much more mature now. Just, this is past. So um, he, says, um, he says, but now we have lost our appetites. We never see anything but manna. Um, the manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground, and then ground it in a, in a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves, and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. Now that means if he heard the whole families, that means bad communication corrupted good manners. Somebody decided that you know what, we don't like how things are going, so we're going to talk about it. And so when I talk to you, Pam, about it, and I get you feeling some type of way about it, then you talk to Cammie. Now Cammie feeling some type of way about it, and she turn around and tell Shannon, and then Shannon tell Robin, and next thing you know, everybody is talking junk about being provided for and not being able to look at the sacrifices that was made for you to even have that. So, so, so good intentions, you know, Pam, you know, knew, she knew the word. She knows the word. Somebody got in her ear, made her feel some type of way. Start questioning, hmm, getting too deep. You know what I'm saying? Instead of accepting it for what it was, and now you, now you like, well, that, that did happen, didn't it? Like, but I mean, I, I get that he gave us manna, but why we couldn't have manna and some, 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 some? Because when we was back in Egypt, like, we had five-course meals. We was eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but it just seemed like all we getting now was just this one thing, and I'm just a little over it. And you get to talking to Cammie, and Cammie be like, you know what, you're right. I'm getting a little tired of it myself. When Cammie wasn't even thinking about being tired, because Cammie was like, yes, manna. You know what I'm saying? But she made her feel some type of way. So it spread throughout the camp. And this kept happening over and over and over and over again. Even on to the point, and instead of just, just reading everything, because I, I, I want y'all to read it, and I wanted to read it to you, because I, really I really want us to be a well-taught place of people. But you can read it. You know where we are. But it went on like that, um, situation after situation. And even to the point where... You know, and I will, let's go to this one. Let's go to this one. Is it anything, let me see if it was anything else that I wanted to pull out of that, because it was, it was a lot to read, but um, let's look at um, Numbers 13, where we were going to go a little bit ago. But did you all get what I was saying out of that? They began to complain, and they began to talk amongst themselves. You have to be careful about, because the word is seed. Okay, you got to be careful about the seed that you spreading, that you putting out there, because it can contaminate some things. 
And then you wonder, you know, how did a group of people go from being so appreciative and trusting God for everything to talking junk? Are we at number 13? Let me get there with you. Okay. And the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. Now, do y'all hear that? Listen to that. He said, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. If somebody gave you something, that means you have it, Right? So in that sense, when God said, I've given you, it's all taken care of. Basically, you just got to, you know, go on the journey, go to the spot, do what you need to do. God was trying to teach the people how to be dependent upon him. You see, Jesus is the the, the same example in the new covenant. When the disciples was raised up, when the words was given, when when Jesus quoted, it's written, that came from over here in the old covenant. It wasn't something that he just newly transcribed, transcribed. It was written. He was repeating what was written. The Jews have a way of passing down the blessing. It is they it is important for them to share who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was and what they did. Somehow we as a people, we've lost the understanding of why we do what we do, why we serve God, who he is. The kids grow up understanding. They grow up that way. So now the same guidelines and rules and regulations that were then there are the same ones that's even in the New Testament. Jesus wants us. Remember when I told y'all he sent the disciples out? He was like, yo, don't pack no food. Don't take no money. Don't take no belt. Just go out and preach the gospel. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And God has already raised up people. Like you've been taken care of. You've been provided for. Getting them to the place where they began to learn how to hear from God, trust in God, and rely on God. That's all he wants. It's, it, you know, we have teachers and instructors, but our our what our responsibility is, just like even as a mom and a dad, is to train, is to teach, is to equip. It's not to get up and be like, oh, you did a good job, oh, you so eloquent, all that kind of stuff. Because if you ain't taking nothing away from what's being shared, it was a waste of, it was a waste of time and preparation. Do you understand? So Moses was like, you know, if y'all have read the Bible, like, like I told you the other day, I said, I don't understand why more Jews haven't convert, converted to Christianity. I, I don't. Because the grace that we have in the new covenant because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, see, Big Daddy back in the day, he, he wasn't about that life. Like, he cut you off. Like, that's a wrap. It wasn't no grace for that. He took people out. Now, it comes in the form of the destroyer, but it was allowed. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, do you understand what I'm saying? Because people get confused about the old covenant and be like, oh, well, God was taking people out. Yes, because he was God. And he was trying to train the people. It's like, listen, I'm giving y'all instructions. And the cool thing about it is God gave Abraham instructions. He gave Moses instructions. He was like, look, tell the people, ba, ba, ba. Especially from Exodus on. Moses, tell the people who I am and what they can expect from me, but this is what I'm going to be expecting from them. He laid it out, line upon line. He laid it out. When I was listening, I was like, dang, for real. He laid it out. And then what they say, I bet we can roll with that. We can do it. That's what they said. Now, we don't even have that same luxury because you come in here and we talk about Jesus and then we do an altar call and we want you to come to Jesus on the strength that of what we told you that he died and, and went to heaven and that there's a hell and we don't want you to go to hell and we want you to have a better life in Christ. But the way how God broke it down to them, I said, I don't understand how now Jew ain't converted. 
Because the grace that's available was not available then. They should want to come up under this Messiah and know him as the true and living God. Because the rules and the regulations and the policies, if you will, that God laid out for the people to, they just, we can't. It's 45 minutes already. How did it happen? Oh my gosh. Okay, we're going to fast forward. We're going to fast forward. So he says, he says, he says, which I am giving to them. I'm still in verse two. And he says, from each ancestral tribe, send one of the leaders. So out of all, because you know there was the, the 12 tribes of Israel. So they were the tribes that were represented. He was like, send one from each tribe and send them to go up, you know, to just explore the land. So when you think about exploring, what do you think? Y'all, we going up there. You know what I'm saying? We're going to see what the houses look like. You know, we're going to check out, you know, because God has given us this place, right? That was my understanding. He says, um, he says, he says, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns they live in? Are they un unwalled or are they fortified? How's their soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some fruit of the land. They said it was fruit season during that time. So they go up to do that. And again, an interesting situation. Now it was 12 representatives that went up. But Caleb and Joshua was the only ones that came back and had something positive and strong to say. And what did they do? They stuck with the promises of God. You told us basically to go up here, it was ours, I right, bet we going. That's it, ain't no questions. But not everybody in the group that went agreed with that. And when they didn't agree with that, what did they do? They went back to their tents and they was hanging out with their family members and friends and they began to talk and they began to complain and what? God heard them. And because God was so gangster, he was like, y'all some ungrateful. Y'all ain't gonna make it. I'm done. Y'all ain't gonna make it. I'm gonna take the people who believe me and we're gonna go on and we're gonna do great things. Because I'm, I'm just over y'all. That's basically what he said. But then Moses was like, come on now. Don't do that. You know? But the end result is that a lot of them ended up getting cut off anyway. But let's look at, um, let's look at numbers, let's see, 14. Who helping me preach back there? Numbers 14, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. Did y'all just hear me say this in a previous text? Same stuff. So, do y'all, can y'all imagine just how we sound to God sometimes? how ungrateful we can be. And you know un the ungratefulness many times comes from something we were talking about in our women's fellowship, jealousy, envy, comparisons. Because instead of us figuring it out who we are in Christ, we take on other people's identity. We try to. Because I like Stephanie's hair. I used to wear my hair like that. Then I decided I wanted to go natural. And I didn't want to be blowing my hair out all the time. And then I made another transition to, to lock my hair up. So I will never see that day. So it don't make no sense for me to get jealous. If I really want it that bad, I can go buy me a wig. But it's not that serious. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then I could just be envious. I could just not want you to have it. like or make you feel bad about the fact that you have hair and convince you to go natural and now you miserable. Like I never wanted to do that. But do you see how it happens? 
begin to compare with other people. We begin to compare how somebody else's business is doing, how somebody else's weight loss journey is going, how somebody else's childcare is going, how somebody else's marriage is going. We compare and we get lost. And that's exactly what happened to the people in, Israel, in, in, in Egypt. They began to reflect on what was and what they had and they would just temporarily get in moments of, of getting lost in the past when it's just so much easier to get into a place where we learn how to sacrifice by giving thanksgiving, even when we don't feel like it, even when situations may not be going the way that we want them to go, because in those moments, that's when we make some bad decisions. Pastor Lockhart tells us all the time, do not make a major decision in a low place. Now, how many of you all can honestly say that you've been in a low place in your life, but you made a decision based upon your emotions? What, what, what you wanted to do, what felt good to you at that time. You didn't care about how it was going to affect your family or anybody else. It was what you wanted. And as a result of that, you did it. And as a result of that, it not only affected you, but then it ended up affecting everybody else around you because it was a huge decision that you made in a low place. And not everything is resolved by apologizing. Some people lose, lose so much because that room, yeah, God forgive you, but man don't, we should, we should, but not every man does, not every woman does, not everybody respects the principle and the law of forgiveness. And so it builds up these things on the inside of us and it, and it pushes us in places that we shouldn't, you know, we, we don't want to go in.